Uh, we're going to do another episode of The Next Step on TVSB, which, by the way, uh, is available, as all episodes are, on uh, Ustream and YouTube. If you will uh, search, Google search uh, The Next Step TVSB uh, Ustream or The Next Step TV uh, SB uh, YouTube, you can find these show, this show and uh, other shows that we've presented in the past. Uh, Hap Ziegler is an attorney, uh, California, Pennsylvania experience, uh, who is now a consultant uh, with uh, law firms and other agencies and has opinions on some interesting subjects that I admire. Uh, Hap and I are going to today talk about uh, the Supreme Court's recent uh, decision in the McCutcheon case and uh, more generally I think um, my thesis that the Supreme Court in the last 15 or 20 years is taking uh, uh, positions that are basically an attack on, uh, the, on our democratic tradition and, and process. Um, so let's start off though with the recently decided case of McCutcheon versus Federal Elections Commission. Hap, welcome. Thank you. Nice Why don't you to be tell, here. Us, tell us a little bit about uh, how Mr. McCutcheon's case got before the Supreme Court. Well, Mr. McCutcheon was a, is a citizen of, of Alabama, I believe, and he gave the maximum individual contribution to the total limit that he's allowed to give and then complained that he was not allowed to continue giving money to additional candidates. Let's just, uh, under federal law uh, that was passed way back in the uh, Nixon era reform times. Correct. Uh, the Congress of the United States passed that legislation that prohibited, that allowed people to give monies to multiple candidates, but it set limits on the total amount of money they give to any one candidate and the total amount of candidates they could give money to. That's correct. And it's been amended a couple times. And the recent limits, without going over all of them, uh, the recent limits are $2,600 per candidate, $3,204 for a national party, $10,000 to state local committees, and $5,000 to other political committees. And the key here is the overall biennial limit was $123,000 48,600 to all candidates and 74,600 to all PACs and parties. So what has changed... But let's oh, get this go ahead, sure. so, so Mr. McCutcheon was able to give under the existing law as much as $120,000 a year? Uh, my, my recollection is that he actually gave $123,000 $200 and had to stop. And he was complaining because he wanted to give, I, I know it was sort of ceremonially uh, phony, but he, he wanted to give $1,776, he said, to a whole bunch of other Republican candidates, and the, right. the law says you can only give it to 20. That's correct. Uh, and he said that's a violation of my freedom of speech. Correct. He founded his appeal on the fact that that is the way he expresses his desire for the candidates and the issues that he wants to support and therefore limiting the amount of money was a way of limiting his free speech without a sufficient government reason for limiting the free speech. Well, we all agree that there are limits on, on free speech. Yes, I think uh, they even said so in the opinion. Right. right. And, and, the, and up, it isn't the first time, I mean, it sounds to many people it sounds a bit odd to say that money, the ability to spend money, is equivalent to the ability to, to make a, a speech or to be heard politically. But it's not the first time the U.S. Supreme Court has addressed the issue of money as a form of speech. Right. Just a quick little background. The more or less the foundational case was a case called Buckley versus Vallejo, uh, heard in 1976. And that's where they basically came down and said, there can't be any limit on expenditures, but there could be limits on contributions. And uh, we'll decide if you want to get into the more complex issues, but basically they differentiated between expenditures and contributions. And it turned out to be an untenable uh, difference. And uh, 
even as late as 2000 in the case of Nixon versus uh, Shrink, Missouri government, uh, and that Nixon is not the president Nixon, that's the yes. attorney general for the state of Missouri, uh, they applied the Buckley decision to all states and state elections. Uh, Kennedy, Scalia, and Thomas dissented, uh, which was obviously a foretelling of what was about to come. But in that case, and you said some people find it hard to believe, in that case, one of the famous quotes of that case is, money is property, money is not speech. Money is property, money is not speech. And we won't get into Citizens United right now, because that, to me, is a, a, a commentary that is belied by Citizens United, which now holds that corporations that is correct. are property, which are property, corporations are property, are entitled to First Amendment rights. So, and that's part of this attack that I was speaking about before. But let's go back to Buckley versus sure. Vallejo and the, and the law that had, had, had existed and has existed in this country since the 1970s, at least uh, uh, passed as a reform measure saying, look, at, we all know as real people in this country that if you give too much money to one candidate, or if one person gives a whole lot of money to any given candidate, that person is going to be given benefits for that money. No, you, you know, of all, uh, Miss, Mr. McCutcheon's complaint aside, in the year of this litigation, I understand, something like 600 people, 600 and some people had, had given, uh, had, had met had been stopped from giving more money because they'd given to the limit. So out of a nation of 310 million adults, um, only 600 and some had actually uh, found themselves up against the limit line. And yet M Mr. McCutcheon, and that's something like 0.000019%. Whatever the math whatever the Whatever that number is, it's, a, it's an infinitesimally small number of people that are affected by this were affected by this law, yet the Supreme Court took the case and decided they would, uh, w you know, and, and I think we, we need to think about this. The Supreme Court w willfully took this case. And I know, and I think you know, that this Supreme Court is out hunting for lawsuits that are going to come to conclusions that they would like to reach. And I think this is one that they went and found. I think that the Supreme Court traditionally decides what issues are ripe so to speak, for hearing. And the, the philosophical view of the, of the justices' influence which cases get heard. Well, you and, know, I, I think uh, it's a... I don't I, know if I, you I, want to explain certiori here to the no, folks. No, I don't. Okay. I, you know, I, uh, I, what I want to say is that I think, you know, this is a layperson's program, and I think that what we've got here, and I mentioned this on other cases before, the, the, the litigation over the prayers in the Pennsylvania school, uh, uh, City Council uh, chambers and other things, I think the Supreme Court has gone out uh, aggressively under this administration, under this Roberts Court, it has gone aggressively looking for certain kinds of issues that they want raised. And it didn't hurt anything that this, this issue was raised when one, one of the litigants was the Republican Party. So uh, the majority of the court appointed by the Republican presidents uh, uh, is probably going to be fairly deferential to a petition from the Republican National Committee to saying we want you to look at this lawsuit. You can hold your peace on that if you want, but I don't have any hesitancy <laughs> in suspecting the, that they got preferential hearing uh, when other cases of more merit might not have. But so they, 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 the, in the course of the argument of this litigation, there was a back and forth discussion on, in, in court, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, Scalia got into it with one of the lawyers for the, uh, uh, for the FEC. Federal Elections Commission, correct. Yeah, which was trying to enforce this law. Correct. And saying, well, you know, people, you know, there's a lot of money in stake. Uh, there's, there's money at stake here, and, and people can give as much as, I think, it's $3.5 or something like that. You mean after the decision? No, before the decision or whatever, after which, whatever. And Scalia, Justice Scalia, and this goes back to my premise that they come from a different side of the, of the world's view than I do. <laughs> Scalia uh, famously said, I don't think 3.5 million is a lot of money. I, and this, isn't this part of the issue? It, it, it is part of the issue. Uh, you know, it was interesting, uh, just to kid a couple more cases that, that, that went on. Uh, one of the cases was uh, Davis, 
versus the Federal Election Commission. And there's where they started breaking down the barriers. They basically declared the Millionaire's Amendment unconstitutional, and that was nobody could use even their own money over a million dollars. And that was struck down and say that people are allowed to spend their own money any way they want to. We can't put limits on that right. unless it's for an illegal activity. And that's what led into Citizens United, which was the launching point to basically eviscerate the Buckley position. And even legal scholars feel that Buckley was not a well-reasoned opinion. Valero, but, but, but I'm sorry, was it Valero? I no, Vallejo. Buckley, Valero. Yeah, you're right. Uh, but but the point, yeah, it was a well-reasoned position. Whatever, whatever lawyer fine points might be, for 40 years the courts yes. of this nation had upheld the general concept that we can have reasonable limits on on um, expenditures in political campaigns and the amount of money that in, one individual can give. And the rationale for that was, as I understand it, that we not only have potential for quid pro quo corruption, but we also have the appearance of impropriety. Where uh, Bucky, even though they, they changed it, they didn't get rid of it altogether because they said, it's a reasonable legislative purpose that, uh, that citizens should be comfortable that the that the recipient of these gifts is not being so unduly influenced or appears to be so unduly influenced that they're not doing their independent job of representing all of us. Well, that's the, that's the interesting spin that's very difficult to get across in, in a few sentences. And, and that's the situation that people, when you really fillet the various arguments, people are not so concerned about the election and the reasoning of the court was giving money to these campaigns is not influencing the election because there, there's no quid pro quo there because it's the voters that actually put the elected person in office and there's no money flowing to the voters. So they're missing that connection and then the then the really interesting part is that that the court felt that giving the the money would actually increase the amount of people that get involved in politics because now more money means more people will be giving money to the various campaigns and no single contributor will have that much influence. Now, we've certainly heard the news about Edelson and his $120 million contributions, which is very confusing, probably a little confusing to me, and I'm sure confusing to those watching. How does he give $120 million when I just said the limit is $123,000? We won't get into that, but the point is that through political action committees and other ways, they can influence with the money. So. That's a very interesting standpoint that by allowing more money in, we'll get more democracy. Well, again, the, yeah, the Roberts' opinion, uh, as I say, I mean, they, they took this case and they, and they wanted to do something about Buckley. They wanted to change the law that said that we have, uh, that, that we were limits on contributions. They found it and then they came up with some rationalizations. I mean, I, I think their rationalizations saying somehow or another that this would encourage more participation is your, is your point. But we know statistically it was only 600 and some people that even came up against this issue. Uh, everybody was allowed to participate. Of the 320 or 10 million Americans of adult age that could, could make contributions to political campaigns, only 600 and a few were prohibited from making more than the maximum. I, I did so, hear So, I mean, it's a nonsensical argument. It, it, you know, on the, other, on the other side of that argument is that uh, you know, if, if, if people with lots of money can be heard, you know, they're saying, well, your right to be heard depends on how much money you have. It means the poor, the poverty people, aren't heard at all. There's no, I mean, if, you, if you're going to make the direct equation that dollars equal speech, then very, very rich people get to be heard with a megaphone and the poor can't be heard at all. And that is part of the reason that legislation was first passed was was to 
equal this balance so that you know, right. we would be able to all be heard. And now we have a court, a five to four decision that says uh, people with lots of money get to be heard more than people without money. Well, I, I, and you understand the defense of that or the, the contra arg argument is that uh, everybody can be heard. Uh, and, and they brought in the fact of the internet that people can get their opinions out there without much, if any, money. And uh, the question is, how legitimate are the concerns? Now, one of the interesting things with Citizens United, and for those that don't recall, Citizens United allowed expenditures by corporations to be the same as individuals. And that's a slight change. I think the Hatch Act, and then there was another act, I'm trying to remember what it was. Tillman Act. Uh, Tillman Act. Uh, limited government contractors and and Hatch Act it limited corporations on what they could not give to individuals. Th th those have been modified a little bit with the uh, what was it seventy four Act I believe. But but the interesting thing is, in California where corporations were allowed to give for state, there were no corporations in the top ten contributions. Contributions, and. What's, what's really happened from the few people that have done analysis that I saw is the, the corporations believe it's too indirect to give money in elections. They would much rather give money to lobbyists. <laughs> and, of course, any of us that have read the papers, we know the gargantuan amounts that are being spent on lobbyists. But, but it's interesting, I think, that the corporations basically seconded, it, seconded the opinion of the majority by their wallets. They said, we don't care if we have unlimited money to give on campaigns. We know how to get it done. We're going to go through the lobbyists. Right. Well, huge amounts. I mean, but the same argument that, this, that, that, that the McCutcheon case is making, that money is speech, would seem to me to mean that giving money to lobbyists who are specifically there so you can be heard yes. is also speech. Therefore, there are, can be no limits on lobbying. There can be no registration of lobbyists, perhaps. There can be no uh, disclosure of how much money. You can, a lobbyist should be able to take you to Florida for a, a week of sun and fun and, and not have to disclose that. That's all part of the speech, I would think. Um, well, it's certainly, it's certainly if you follow the string that the majority is pulling through the right. Supreme Court, it's basically introduce, introducing more and more excesses uh, in, well, the, in the area of money, of money. In, and, and, into yeah. the decision making. This, yeah, this is my thesis for this show. I'm trying to get back to this sure. idea that, that the Supreme Court under the, the present uh, Roberts Court and, and, and before it with the 5-4 majorities are, are, are creating a whole lot more rights for people with money than for people who don't have money. And they're saying to those of us who are trying to create a uh, 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 ballot, you know, like the old days when we used to have requirements of uh, equal time on the air. Yes, that got thrown out, so that people who can buy people buy time get to be heard, and people who needed didn't have the money to buy. It. How many how many people running campaign now with federal financing anymore? Because there's so much money in it, the federal fin right. that the contributions from the federal finance laws aren't enough to even begin. I mean, and President Obama was uh, as much responsible for the destruction of that because he rejected it knowing he could get more money from the banks and other institutions than he would be able to get from federal funding. But anyway, so money, corporate money uh, under Citizens United as free speech, uh, individual contributions under McCutcheon as free speech is overwhelming the voices and the ability of individuals to be heard, in my opinion. And I would even take it back a step further than that uh, to the most infamous case, I think, of the modern of the, of the century is Bush v. Gore, in which the the Supreme Court intervened to stop a direct count of the elections in Florida that would actually find out who won. You know, was act, the Supreme Court, the, the court in Florida had ruled, as you recall, we are going to discount all the votes. Now you're. I, th th this is money and democracy. Not well, it's, You're it's, not trying to imply that money had anything to do with... <laughs> I'm trying to imply that the Republican <laughs> Party, uh, which took that appeal and, and tried to re and reverse the Florida Supreme Court decision in front of a U.S. Supreme Court staff by Republican appointees, would have been influenced by the, the, the litigants. 
And, but it also implies that I think that there's a direct attack on popular democracy. They just, uh, they just struck out the, uh, the, the Civil Rights Voting Act that required preclearance of voter inhibition, of, of voter registration laws. You, you know right, right. that since the 60s, uh, certain states had a history of discriminatory voting rights were required to get approval before they changed their voting laws. And the U.S. Supreme Court, this same court, threw that out. So I see a, a thread here of, of, of uh, approval of support for moneyed interests and wealth uh, 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 and calling it First Amendment is strange. Uh, at the same time, they are trying to uh, hinder direct voting democracy and the ability of ordinary people without money to be heard. So that's, I, I, that's I, my... I, that's just one thing that you said, I would just clear up, uh, to give more rights to some people. I don't think... I don't think it can be read to give more rights, just more influence. I think it's more rights. I'd say that. But when when somebody can, uh, when they, when they say you can spend, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of corporate monies to influence an election, and an ordinary person could never contemplate spending that kind of money, uh, I don't think those I don't think those are equal balances. Well, of course, that goes back to many of the issues we've talked about, talk about civil rights. I mean, mm -hmm. the fact that you say, okay, everybody can go to college now and don't take into account the, the decades or centuries where people did not live, certain groups of people did not live with the same kind of options, family upbringing, mm -hmm. environment. Uh, you know, they, they didn't have the same rights, I guess, is the way you're saying. Well, I think that's what affirmative action was about. Yes. That's a whole different ballgame. I'm just saying it's the same I, idea. We could do an interesting show on that. But yeah. yeah, I mean, well, I think it is. It's, it's, it's something. You know, George Bush, if you want to get uh, on the aside, George Bush complained uh, and his, his ilk complained about affirmative action, which brought in poor people and minorities and women and others uh, uh, into schools that they normally would not have been able to be into. But he never complained about his admission into these schools as heritage, or whatever they call themselves, legacy students. I mean, if that's not a form of affirmative action, what is? And that's exactly what I'm talking about. Rich people with context get heard and always got heard. And then legislation that comes along and tries to even the playing field so that we all have the same voice, uh, say, in the political election by limiting the amount of money the really, really rich can spend because nobody else is able to spend that kind of money. Those laws are thrown out. And we end up with a, uh, a, a system in which money is even more important than it was. It's, yes. it's not much, you know, the, the, we, you talk about Citizens United and the, and the restrictions on corporate giving. Those restrictions on corporate giving went back to 1910. Yep. 1910, 1917, 1907 was the first one, and then, yeah. And this was Teddy Roosevelt's uh, uh, agenda. I right. mean, this is a, a, a Republican president uh, who's trying to rein in corporate giving by saying corporations are not people and they cannot be treated as people for purposes of the First Amendment. There's a reason we have a right to, to limit their uh, expenditures in certain arenas because they're distorting the system. Right. And as I say, it, uh, I, I think the bigger issue is really that McCutcheon is laying the groundwork the next case is going to strike down the $2,600 per candidate. Well, let's just make sure the audience understands what happened here. And it isn't a phenomenal decision that they left that alone. Uh, the, the issue that McCutcheon was challenging it wasn't, was it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't what was appealed. Well, not just, just saying they could have reached out and grabbed that Justice, issue. Justice uh, Justice Thomas was willing to uh, to reach it. His his concurring opinion well, said we yeah. should strike all these things. But let's we make know, sure the audience. We know how smart Judge Thomas is by the <laughs> questions he asks during the oral argument. But, but the point being that the, the court threw out the amount of of candidates, the limits on the amount of candidates this man could contribute to, but they did not throw out. The fact that you could only give five thousand, or where it was, well, twenty six hundred dollars per individual candidate. Yeah. So, you know, <coughs> if one would think, and this is what you're saying, they're headed for. One would think that if it's a First Amendment right to give to to forty eight candidates, not twenty, he's also got a First Amendment right to give five thousand dollars to ten candidates yes. instead of the two thousand. I think that's where limits. we're headed. 
Well, why wouldn't they have done it? But which is interesting. Uh, but yes, uh, that's going to be a next step. Well, I think it's a little t technical, but I think the reason they didn't do it is you chip away at these things at the Supreme Court with just little chips. When you try to throw too many issues in one case, you end up getting re too many reasons you can get re uh, reversed. Well, I understand why McCutcheon didn't take it up because they didn't think. I think McCutcheon's attorneys yes. and the Republicans didn't, the yes. Republican National Committee did not believe <laughs> they would get so far as to have all of these issues addressed in one litigation. Correct. Uh, so they took up what they thought they could bite off and win. So that's a, that's a, that's a legal strategy right. having less to do with the philosophy than it has to do with the tactics on how you take baby steps to get where you want to go. So let's talk about what we as citizens in the last couple of minutes we have here might do to try to get around these, in, these losses. I mean, try to recover the ground that I think is essential to a, uh, a fair democracy in which all the sides are able to be heard. Uh, one of the things would be constitutional amendment. We know that that's going to be difficult, uh, but there are people since Citizens United who've been trying to change, uh, to get a constitutional amendment enacted, which would say that corporations aren't people, money isn't speech, uh, and you know that's a possibility. Now we all think it's hard, but I'm, I'm remembering that there was a time when U.S. senators under the Constitution were appointed by the legislatures of the various states. They were not right. elected by the people of those states. And those senators got bought. They, they were so, it was so corrupt that corporations were going into Montana or Wyoming or other states and just simply buying uh, the, the votes in the, uh, the legislative bodies to get their person elected, uh, appointed as a senator and becoming a U.S. senator. And we passed, I think it was the 18th Amendment or 20th Amendment, some, some amendment changed the Constitution and said that we will now elect our senators by popular vote. So it's possible. It, it is possible, and I think that that's probably the, the only way it's going to, to work. I think well, yeah. it's the only way it can be reversed because the court has basically said Congress does not have the constitutional authority to pass these kind of laws. Uh, well, or you could get a Supreme Court change. Oh. Okay. <laughs> well, we're going to run out of time. I want All to right. thank Ali Adichak, uh, who's back there, and uh, Liz Tess Burke, uh, who are doing the work on this. One thing we should paint out, I mean, and an issue that liberals and progressives should be thinking about is whether Justice Ginsburg should be resigning from the court to allow a possible appointment before she, too, uh, is replaced by a conservative. It would be interesting perhaps on one of your shows to just talk about the, the procedures and process to get government structured the way you want it structured as opposed to normally we just chat about what's happened after the elections and appointments have all taken place. Be good. Well, so thank you to the audience and uh, thank you crew.